Today we're trying a few things new. We have a slightly different overlay. I'm not sure if I'm in love with it or not, but it is what it is today. I'm not entirely sure my um, chat aggregator is going to work either. I tried this yesterday, trying a new method, and uh, well, it didn't work. So we will see if it works today. I'm not even sure where I need to go to view this show. Oh, here it is, live now. So okay, good. Let's type test. Maybe test will pop up. The test pop up pops up. We're in good shape. Woo! It did. It did pop up. That's good. Okay. There is a tiny, tiny chance everything is functioning properly. If everything functions properly, we will be good to go. If everything doesn't function properly, well, then we may have problems, but we will deal with that when we get there. Okay. Good, good, good. Nice, nice. All right. Yesterday, I had a webinar with James Romero, who's going to be the new coach at PokerCoaching.com. We have hired a bunch of coaches recently. We've hired um, Faraz Jaka. You all may know here. You know him. He was World Poker Tour Player of the Year, just like I was. Let me show you the trophy I got for that. It's this thing. I presume Faraz has one as well. If you win World Poker Tour Player of the Year, they give you this. It's actually very heavy. I think it weighs like, I don't know. What does this weigh? This weighs a solid 18 pounds, if I had to guess. So you want to win the Player of the Year because they give you cool stuff. It's actually kind of unfortunate because the year after I won Player of the Year, they gave away something like a $25,000 poker table and a sick watch. When I won, they gave me a trophy. Not that I'm complaining. It's a nice trophy, but kind of ran poorly on that one. Let me put this back away. Okay. So we hired Faraz. We hired Jonathan Jaffe. Jonathan Jaffe is a world-class poker player as well, who I'm happy to have on board. We hired uh, Michael Acevedo recently, the GTO expert in the poker world. We hired Lexi Gavin, who crushes the live cash games and tournaments. And, um, well, we hired Jonathan, uh, James Romero yesterday, who is, in my opinion, one of the best young poker players on the tournament circuit. He has worked hard to get really good at poker. And, um, well, he's crushing poker. He's cashed for about... $5 million live, $4.5 million, let's not exaggerate, $4.5 million over the last few years. And half that time he was in Costa Rica grinding, so it's like not even, you know, he didn't even put in full years of live poker. But he's decided recently to play more live poker, and um, over, well, I was going to say over the last few months, the last few months we haven't actually played a lot of poker. But recently he's won a high roller, took third place in a big 10K, so I'm happy to have him on board. And he actually inspired me to do this talk today on how to play your best in high pressure situations. This is something that gives a lot of players a lot of trouble. And James said something in his interview yesterday with me that made me think of this because essentially he said that I don't really have to, it's not all that difficult for me to go and play poker at this point because I already know basically what to do in every scenario. And then when I'm studying, I learn new things to integrate into my game, and then I just do it, right? And I think what happens to a lot of people is they get in their heads because they don't actually know, based on good, solid math, what they are supposed to do in various scenarios. And when you don't know what to do, you end up guessing. And when you start guessing, that's when you just can go off the rails and completely screw up. What's my advice to make it as a pro poker player for a living? Google Jonathan Little Professional Poker Player How To or something like that. And um, an article on JonathanLittlePoker.com will probably come right up. Um, long story short, find a game you can beat and play it a ton and play properly bankroll. It's really all you have to do. Easier said than done, though. All right. So whenever you do make it to a high-pressure situation, first things first, is this a rare occurrence or a frequent occurrence? Because, I mean, let's get real. In reality, if you normally play $100 buy-in tournaments and you find yourself at the final table of a $1,000 tournament randomly and first place would quadruple your bankroll or something like that just because that's how we find, found ourselves in this scenario, well, yeah, that's going to be high pressure and um, that should be understood. At the same time, though, some people think that if they find themselves 
in the money in their regular daily tournament, that that's a high pressure situation. And you need to recognize that some things are rare occurrences, but some things are just normal and routine. And eventually, eventually, if you play a lot, everything becomes routine. I mean, whenever I'm sitting there playing any like final table now, I just, I'm not, it's not that I don't care. It's that I don't let it impact my play at all because I know like these plays are good or these plays are bad and I'm, I'm just going to make the right play, right? And that's what you need to do. You need to understand that your job is to just make the right plays. That really is your job. You know, I think my camera is focusing on my microphone. I think that's why everything in the background is blurry. Let me try something real quick. Sound may get worse. But does the picture get better? Hmm. Not sure. We're going to have to fix that. One more thing to tinker with, right? Um, maybe I put it off to the side like this. Maybe I put this down like this. Focus on the face, camera. Focus on the face. If anyone's good at cameras, I have a Logitech, uh, whatever the Logitech camera is everybody uses. I want to have the background more clear. If you can tell me how to make the background more clear, that would be fantastic. All right. So is this situation rare or is the situation common, right? If you find yourself nervous every once in a while, like twice a year, it is what it is. What are you going to do, right? If you find yourself nervous all the time, that's a problem. And probably you just don't know how to play poker all that well, which is going to result in you just guessing a lot. And when you're guessing, you know you're not making good plays because you don't know what the right play is. Now, obviously, some people are going to fool themselves into thinking they know the right play. But I think in most people's heart of hearts, they recognize that that is the case. How much would you have to play before you can consistently earn money from poker? Well, you're probably going to have a tough time ever earning money consistently from poker, depending on what you mean by consistently. But I mean, I started winning pretty much immediately because I studied a ton, right? You're going to find that if you study a lot and get good at poker, you win at poker immediately. If you're bad at poker and goofing off, well, then you're going to have a tough time. Matthew, sorry to hear about your mother. That is definitely tough that you can't visit because of the virus. That makes life difficult. Old Wisco, tough spot. Nice subscribers. We have Keith, all subscribers on Twitch. Thank you very much. All right. Um, okay. So... Whenever you are in these high pressure situations, you want to ask, what is actually going through my mind? Take a second. Take, take a second when you're in these scenarios and think, what am I actually feeling? And I think a lot of people are just going to find themselves feeling uneasy or nervous because they don't want to make a mistake. And inevitably what happens is that will lead to you essentially tilting without realizing that you are tilting, and that will result in you playing whatever default scenario or de whatever default strategy you actually know in your mind. And for most people, that's not actually all that high-level poker because they actually haven't studied poker all that much, right? And you want to make sure that your, you know, base level poker understanding is very, very high so that when things are going poorly or whatever you are um, essentially tilting, that your play does not actually get impacted all that much. Good example of this. You'll see some world-class players who, when they do get tilty, they lose their minds. And you'll see other world-class players who, when they get tilty, they just play completely the same. Um, from what I understand, uh, Dan Cates, Jungle Man, is someone who absolutely loses his mind at the poker table every, all the time or frequently, but from what I also understand, it does not impact his play. This is just pure secondhand knowledge. I don't know this for true, for sure, because I never played with the guy. Or maybe I played with him once, but like it wasn't, you know, just some random tournament. And that's quite powerful to know that that is something that happens. I think I'm actually relatively similar. I, I mean, talking to, to James Romero yesterday, and I, I've been watching Michael Acevedo, our poker coach and coach, stream the last few days. And... Like, he'll just be getting completely screwed in these random all-ins where, you know, like, bad things will happen. Then we'll just, you know, keep playing normally. And that's what you're supposed to do. And that is what basically all of the absolute best players in the world do who come from a solid mathematical background, who understand 
the game very very well at a like a very base level at a root at a you know the root level that they, they know what is good and they know what is bad they don't have to guess whereas a lot of the players who come from the more like live poker point of view very often they are guessing guessing but they guess right way more often than they don't when they are not on tilt and way less often than not whenever they are on tilt and um it's important to realize right next you want to get good. You want to get good at poker so that you just know the right plays. I know I've said this a bunch of times now, but you need to get good at anything so that you are with it. Great example of this. Let's say we're going to have a uh, free throw competition where we're going to see who can shoot the most free throws in basketball. This may be a bad analogy. Let's go with it, though. Let's say... We all practice free throws, we all get good, yet you take someone who is a professional basketball player, and then you take someone like Jonathan Little. Let's say we actually get to where we can shoot the same percentage of free throws. But let's say instead of doing the straight competition, heads up, to see who can get the most out of, let's say, 10 or 100 or whatever, we have to play an entire game of basketball first. Well, you can be pretty sure that the professional basketball player is going to crush it at the free throw shooting competition after playing a whole game of basketball or after running five miles or whatever because they're going to be better conditioned. They're going to understand how to shoot free throws way better. Basically, they're just going to be better at the overall game than a novice, right? Who's learned to do exactly one thing well. This is a bad analogy. It's not like I just didn't say any of that. Um, what it amounts to is you want to be really, 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 really good at whatever you are doing. And being really, really, really good at it is going to be better than not being really, really good at it. And that is really, in my mind, what I think the biggest factor is when determining if you actually will play well or poorly under high-pressure scenarios. Um, next, before you even go to play, I think you want to clear your mind of whatever nonsense is going through your mind that is a distraction. And... That could be many things. So for a lot of people, this is work, business, right? I mean, I deal with this sometimes. I have, I have a lot of stuff to do. Some days, some days none, some days a ton. And I always make a point to wake up a few hours before I go to play a poker tournament. And I do my best to take care of whatever work I have going on. And that may be a lot of work or a little work, but I do make a point to, to do it and to actually complete the tasks such that it's basically off of my plate. I like getting stuff off my plate. It is very, 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 very important to me. And I think that's important for a lot of people. You'll see some people at the poker table like having fights with their significant other or dealing with business at the poker table, which is fine if you don't really care about the poker. But if you do care about the poker, I would suggest you don't have those things going through your brain. Um, relationships are another thing, right? I just mentioned. You want to make sure that you and your significant other are ideally on the same page, or if you're not on the same page, it's going to sound bad, you just have to not care what page they're on. Um, sounds very, very selfish, but to be fair, if your significant other or whoever you care about in your life, let's say, really hates you going to play poker, maybe you shouldn't be going to play poker. But if you're both on the same page, you're going to get up, you're going to go play poker, you're going to spend your time away from them to go play cards, and they're cool with it, and they're actually cool with it, then you'll have no problems, right? Um, I would tell you to ideally not use poker as an escape from life, right? I know a lot of people, they'll have, you know, crappy things happening in life and they'll use poker to kind of forget about it for the time being, which is fine, but I think you'll play worse across the board if you have these other things on your mind, even at a subconscious level. So do your best to clear your mind. You can do this by like working out, by meditating, by addressing the issues, right? These things are all... Very, very, very relevant. Um, Giancarlo says, you're very focused on how many people are left in the tournament. Well, I would generally tell you to not worry about how many people are left in the tournament. Let's say you are playing deep in a tournament and you're getting down to the end of the field and um, you think, oh, there's only six people left. Now I need to, I don't know, knit it up or really play hard to try to win or whatever, realize all these thoughts are not correct. Your goal instead should just be to play fundamentally sound, right? So you get nervous when you're at the final three people. Oh, wait, you get nervous when there's 20 to 30 people left. Ask yourself, why are you getting nervous? Why? Because you 
may or may not win, basically don't count the chickens before they hatch, right? Realize that when there's 20 or 30 people left, your equity is whatever it is, and you're usually not going to collect that equity, but sometimes you're going to collect way more than that equity. Let's see. You often recommend my content to people struggling. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. What's my number one advice on how to weather the storm on a downswing? Keep a big bankroll. Ensure you are playing in games that you can beat and study more than you are playing, ideally. And when people are on a downswing, a few things may be happening, and it's hard to know which one it is, especially if you're not playing with you know, very, very good data, like, like online with Holder Manager or whatever. Um, because you don't actually know, if, you don't definitively know if you're getting unlucky or if you are just you know, playing poorly. So you want to do your best to ensure you're playing games you can beat. An easy way to do that is just to move down. Especially in tournaments, it's like really easy to move down in stakes. It's very, very simple. I mean, in cash games, it's easy too. But I would tell you to move down in stakes. And I would tell you to study your play way more, review your play way more. And really just moving down by itself fixes a lot of problems, assuming you don't have some innate ego problem. Because it essentially doubles or triples your bankroll because... You know, you're playing half the stakes that, you're, that you normally do. So that's good. You double your bankroll right off the bat. And also, the skill level of your opponents is going to be... Well, they're going to play worse, right? And as they play worse, even if you play exactly the same, your win rate will go up. So your win rate's going to go up, and you'll have a bigger bankroll. So do that for a while. Grind back up. That's essentially the easiest way to do it, is double the amount of buy-in slash big blinds you have, and, play, and then play in those games. Do drugs fix tilt? I don't know. I don't experiment with the drugs so much. Um, how do you work on tell reading skills? Check out the work by Zach Elwood. He has a book called Reading Poker Tells. He also has a section in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. It's my book with a bunch of other poker professionals. So check that out. Is it safe and legal to play on global poker? Oh, fortunately for you, I just did a video on this with my lawyer, Mac Verstandig. Let's see if I can find it since I'm already on YouTube. Let's see. We go to... Jonathan Little, we go to videos. I'll link you right to it. How lucky is that? How lucky is it that I'm already on YouTube today? Here it is. Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan. The long story short is um, legal, maybe, maybe not. Is it safe? Well, no one's going to murder you for playing. You might get robbed, but um, no, you'll be fine. Same thing for sites like ACR, Ignition, Bovada. Um, those, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to go to jail for playing on the most likely, but when they close, they're probably going to keep your money for the last time. What are my thoughts on Doyle saying that ACR is soft? I imagine he probably has some sort of clause in his contract with him to say ACR is soft. Fortunately, Doyle was nice enough to mention that he somehow combined with him a long time ago when the government purposely, purposefully shut them down or made them leave. And, um... It's generally good business to not poo on your business partners. But I'm not in business with any of these people. And I'm purely looking out for you, not my quote-unquote business partners. I'm looking out for all of you. And I would tell you to not keep infinite money on there. James said yesterday he plays on ACR. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm not against playing on these various sites. What I am against is representing the various sites, promoting the various sites, with the, un with the promotion being, this is a safe place to park your money and leave it there. I think that's a big mistake. Because if you paid attention to history, all of these sites that are operated within America have closed at one point or another. There's a few that are still around that have been skirting the law, but they may get caught eventually. And you don't want to be the one stuck with your money on those sites when that does happen. So, you know, I realize that Americans have relatively few options, right? So play play those sites, but also don't keep much money on there. I would tell you to not play the apps like um, PPP, Poker Bros. I would tell you to avoid those for sure because those are just like completely unvetted, completely unlicensed. And um, I mean, to be fair, I don't know if like ACR or Bovada or... Uh, Global Poker are actually vetted by any legitimate gaming commission. I'm sure they're vetted by some gaming commission, but legitimate gaming commission is a different story. But at least they've been vetted by someone, right? At least someone has at least looked at the site. Whereas the apps, it's like, yeah, we can turn up the variance if we want. We can turn down your pocket aces if we want. We can turn up the bad river cards for you if we want. Yeah, we don't need that. I don't want to play on sites like that. 
How do you navigate five hour late registration periods? Just realize that there's a lot of variance, right? I don't know anything about this bet online site you all keep asking me about, sorry. Okay, back to the topic at hand. Another trick to help yourself play better in game is to already know, and you have to know this because you're gonna do it, by, you have to know that after the game, you are going to go back and review that game to make sure that you are not making mistakes so that you can improve in the future. Having in your mind the idea that I am going to take care of whatever problems I actually had in game later, but let you focus on the game at hand. And focusing on the game at hand is highly, highly valuable because that's really what you want to do. You want to have your head in the game, not outside the game. Let's say you get it all in and you lose some hand. Some people think, oh, did I get it in bad or did I play this hand poorly? And they'll think about that for like a minute or 10 minutes or you know, anything more than 30 seconds is 30 seconds too long or is you know, 30 seconds more than they should be thinking about it or that's a bad saying. They're thinking about it longer than they should, right? And you don't want to do that. You don't want to be dwelling on the past. Instead, you want to be thinking about the current hand and how to play the current hand to the best of your ability. And if you record your hands and then review them later, that will go a long way to making sure that you know that this will take, be taken care of later. You have to actually do it. You have to have the discipline and integrity to do it, which you know some people will lie to themselves. Maybe that works too if you can lie to yourself. But I would tell you to do that. I see you all have just loads of questions about stuff. What's the mentality on day one, two, three, four, et cetera, of the World Series main event? Can you talk about your end of day goals? I have none. You were short stacked the entire four days and couldn't get out of the hole. Cash, but wasn't happy. Well, realize that your cashing or not cashing should not impact your happiness one way or the other. Because when you buy into a poker tournament, the way this kind of works is you're essentially buying lottery tickets. Let's say we're going to play the World Series main event. There's 10,000 people. And if you're really good, you get three tickets. Three out of 10,000. If you're really bad, you get 0.3 tickets for your one buy-in, right? And that's it. That's exactly what you're doing. You are buying in with an edge or with a disadvantage. And then you are going to play whatever strategy you know and that's it. That's all you're doing. You're just implementing a strategy. Whether you have a strategy clearly defined or not, you are implementing it. There's a saying, uh, whether or not you think you're on a diet, you're actually on a diet. And, you know, diet means, you know, you're, you're eating some sort of effectively predetermined food choice, even if you have not predetermined it. For example, if you have um, ice cream every night at 9 p.m., you have an ice cream diet at 9 p.m., right? That's how you operate. If you, um, you know, you only have salads and lean meat, that's your diet, right? Whenever you go to play a poker tournament, you are playing whatever strategy you know. You're not actually, you're making decisions at the table, but all of those decisions have effectively been pre-made by the study and work you have put in before the tournament and the mental game preparation you have done to make sure you can implement your strategy to the best of your ability. So, um... I just don't care all that much about any individual tournament. You know, I go there, I show up, I play my best. If I lose, I lose. If I win, I win. And I realize that every time I buy in, I'm having some amount of edge. The skill is figuring out how much of that edge you actually have. Thanks for giving you an hour of your time regularly. Oh, you're very welcome. Do you think playing cash games without rake back is suicide? I just think you should get rake back if you can. How do you get a good rake back deal nowadays? Um, know the right people. <laughs> I would tell you to send an email to your poker site and tell them, I'm thinking about playing a, a lot more. I'm trying to find a site that'll give me a good rake back deal. Can you give me 27% rake back? Just send them an email, see what they'll say. On, the, on a lot of the American sites, ACR, et cetera, they just might turn on your 27% rake back because you asked for it. So I would tell you to ask for that. If they will not, but you know that you can get it if you open a new account, close your current account, don't play for a little while. Sign up again through Rakeback deal and then get it. I don't, I mean, you have to worry about some of these Rakeback sites because they are often run by semi shady people. Be careful of that. Another good example of people screwing the poker players back in the day. I mean, maybe you all don't know that, know about this, but back in the day, the way Rakeback was paid is, I mean, it still is today on some sites that are marginal. Um, but basically, you would sign up to an affiliate, and the affiliate would get like 
30% of your rake back for signing you up, which is just a ton of money. <laughs> back in the day when I was playing on party poker a lot, I was paying something like $60,000 in rake every month. So the affiliate would get, let's say, $20,000 of it. But you have a deal with the affiliate where they turn around and give you like 29 out of that 30% for signing up to them. So they get a free 1% per month. So they get a free 600 bucks per month out the door in exchange for facilitating this deal. Which, you know, you sign up 50 guys, $600 times 50, what is that, $30,000 a month for signing up people? I mean, think of the value, right? So it became a race of like who could give the best deal to the highest volume players. So it turns out all the good sit-and-go players, like myself, who were paying tons of rake, were under the same rake back guy who instead of giving 25% rake back, he gave 29% rake back. But it also turns out whenever um, Party Poker shut that deal down, this guy decided to just stiff us for a few months. So he ended up taking, well, instead of $600 from each person, uh, $60,000 from each person or something like that. And, um, or not, sorry, $20,000 from each person for like three months and basically screwed us. And that's the problem with middlemen. You all want to play on these poker apps now where you have to deal with middlemen. You don't want to deal with middlemen because middlemen are just one more point of failure. But anyway, get rake back. You might as well get rake back. How do you deal with frustration and taking huge beats? Don't get frustrated. It doesn't matter. Just play well, right? Like I was telling you, I've been watching Michael Acevedo stream the last few days, and he's had like a final table in a thousand person tournament every day. However, he's taken like sixth place or tenth place, right? And he goes, he's at the final table, he's playing well, and just just loses, right? I mean, sometimes you're just gonna lose. And that's it. If you have any problems logging into our website, email support at pokercoaching.com. If you cash the main event and weren't happy, you should quit the game. Um, I don't know about that. Because again, like, should you be happy if you cash? Not really. Should you be happy if you don't? Unhappy if you don't cash? Not really. You, it should, like, not be a giant impactor to your happiness one way or the other, at least in my opinion. As long as you're playing on, if you're playing on any of these random sites that are unlicensed, unregulated, etc., as long as you are not keeping much money in there and you are actually winning, you're probably going to be fine. Is there a way to see your average prize pool for a spin and go? Hmm, I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't know about that, sorry. How can you earn money as a new player? Play in really, really soft games at really tiny stakes. You're a winning live player, but struggle online. How do you bridge the gap? Learn to play well. The thing is, is a lot of players are really good at reading players or playing essentially the live game where you, um, you adjust really well to what your opponents do wrong. And sometimes it's kind of obvious to you, but when you're playing online, none of that exists or maybe even trick yourself into thinking that exists, but it doesn't. And what ends up happening is you're just not playing very well. So if you do not play good, fundamentally sound poker, you are going to get crushed. And especially if you're playing the same stakes that you normally play live, you're really going to get crushed because the games are much tougher. Like if you play 2-5 live and you try to play $2, $5 no limit online, you're just going to get demolished because it's more like a 25-50 live game or something like that. So you need to be playing much, much smaller stakes and you also need to make sure you learn to play fundamentally well, which we teach at PokerCoaching.com. Check out the spring sale. You can go to PokerCoaching.com slash spring sale. And um, we have big discounts right now. Sign up to Poker Coaching Premium. It sounds like you're taking the game seriously. That's going to go a long way to helping you crush the games. We have tons of content made by some of the absolute best online players in the world. They're for you. So don't miss out. You got a flush draw. And a gut shot straight draw, and they put all in. Wait, should you fold? No, probably not. Don't fold good draws. Assuming you know you're profitable at a given game, how many big blinds should your overall bankroll be? Read jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll, because this is not enough info. You need to know um, how much variance you have. You need to know your actual win rate. You, don't, you need to know quite a few things. You need to know how willing you are to have risk of ruin, et cetera, et cetera. You paid 60K in rake a month. What did you play? $200 buying sit and goes. 3,000 to 5,000 of them a month. Fun stuff, huh? Believe it or not, you pay a lot of rake. Do you have an opinion on ignition? Yes, I already mentioned it about 20 times today. Who do you think the best streamers to learn are from? I don't know. I don't really watch a whole lot of streamers. I actually don't think watching people play in real time is all that useful, especially if they are not purposefully giving you very high level information in real time. Um, if you speak Spanish, Michael Acevedo, <laughs> but he streams in Spanish. 
So that's not so useful for me. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't, that's not how I learn poker. I learn poker from watching the conclusions that the best players make from their study on their own. So I don't know. Um, I don't know. You all throw out some names. Maybe I'll tell you if I think they're good or not. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Mo the problem is most people who are streaming are not doing it purely for educational purposes. They're first off playing a ton of tables at a time and they are not really focusing on giving you educational content. They're more so giving you entertainment content and entertainment content is not educational content. I would much tell you, much prefer to tell you to sign up to a training site and watch their best coaches play online then or review their play online so that they can have gathered thoughts and give you good concise information about what they are doing. I, in USA, yes, you still play online. No. It gets turns. What, sit, what are you saying? You play more no hole and sit and goes. I, instead of pot limit at Omaha, eight or better. I mean, realize they're different games. You just may not like playing the game. There's nothing wrong with playing games for the fun of it. Just realize you're not going to make a ton of money if you play random games that you happen to think are just fun. Best thing you ever did was sign up to poker coaching. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. What's the best book on tournaments? Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. This is not specifically on tournaments. This is on No Limit Hold'em. But it's on range analysis. Learning how to analyze ranges will fix all your problems. If you know how to analyze ranges, you will be in very good shape. If you don't, you're going to be screwed. Yeah, Jamie Staples has good stuff. I don't, uh, bet on Drew has good stuff. Spraggy has good stuff. BBZ has good stuff. But I mean, like, again, I, I'm not watching this, so, so I don't, I don't, um, I don't actually know because I'm not in there watching streamers all the time. I am busy making all the content for all of you and taking care of the content that all of my coaches are making. It's, it's important to realize also that it takes a very specific life setup to be a streamer that a lot of people either do not have or do not want to have. I mean, for example, I started streaming before people were even allowed to stream on Twitch. They banned me. I was apparently the first pro person to try to stream poker on Twitch. And Twitch thought gam playing uh, gambling games on Twitch is illegal, so they banned me. And I streamed for like, you know, 12 hours a day every day because that's what I was doing back then. And I had a decent life set up for that. I was sitting at home with, you know, nothing to do besides play on poker all day. And that's, that's all I was doing. And it was nice and easy. But now I have a wife and two kids and I have all of you to try to help. And that is not a great environment to sit and grind 12 hours of poker all day, every day. Right? So it's not, this is like not in the cards for me. And it turns out a lot of the people who have actually crushed it the hardest, who still crush it the hardest, that's actually not in the cards for them either because they don't need to play all day to make money or to make ends meet, essentially. And you'll find that a lot of the, the best poker training sites are run by people who don't actually play poker all day, every day, and aren't just sitting there streaming all day, every day. I'm not saying that people who stream are necessarily not good at poker. But what I'm saying is it takes a very different life setup. And I think as you accumulate enough monetary wealth, you stop grinding in the lower value times, right? So if you're not going to grind in the lower value times, it kind of implies that you're not going to be a consistent streamer, or at least not a regularly consistent streamer. So you're inevitably not going to be all that popular because to be a popular streamer, to some extent, you either have to have a giant name or you have to stream a lot. And the absolute best poker players in the world don't actually play poker all the time. They may be playing like four days a month, or four, I'm sorry, four days a week at most. And even then they may not want to stream it every single time and... A lot of the best players in the world don't want to give away information. They're the opposite of me. They try to hoard the information instead of instead of give it away. What was that book I just held up? Sorry, it's backwards for uh, Instagram. Mastering Small Stakes, No Limit Hold'em. Yeah, Grips has good, stream, good streams. We have any promos for the 2020 World Series of Poker? We'll probably, well, if they run it, we'll be giving away a $10,000 main event seat to one of you. Is the video section on poker coaching new? Yeah, so we've, we are in the process of making a lot of changes to the layout and structure of pokercoaching.com. The video section is now, it's replaced the classes section, and it is now searchable, 
You can also, so you can search like any term. So if you want to look up three bet, you can type three bet, it'll come right up. Also, you can sort by coach, you can sort by date, you can sort by a bunch of things. We're gonna have a bunch of tags coming to that very, very soon that will basically be the same as the old classes tab. So we've, we've changed the structure a little bit to try to make it easier for you to find the content you want. You like Fenton a lot too, sure, yeah. Why isn't a brand pushing for cash game festivals? Um, how do you show it off? That's the question. How do you, so like whenever you run a poker tournament series, it's easy to show off. You show off the tables with the best players. So every day you have a table with really good players. And also every day, well, you, if you run a, a series, you have a final table every day that's, that you can put on TV. So that makes a lot of logical sense. However, how do you run a cash game festival? Inevitably, good cash game players don't want to play against each other. So you won't have a table with a bunch of good people. So what do you show off? You show off just the high stakes games? You show off a random table? I mean, do, you, do people really care about watching a random table of people playing cash games? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Your bank account was closed because of a DraftKings deposit. You got to be careful with any sort of gambling-ish related deposits into your bank account. Bank of America banned me a while back, so we don't bank with them anymore. Lost poker players been banned by Bank of America. How do group how do study groups work? They work in all sorts of ways. Is there one on poker coaching? Well, we have the Discord, and on Discord, people are connecting all the time. So go to pokercoaching.com, click on the tools section, click on Discord, type on there in uh, whatever the relevant channel is. Does anyone have a study group I can join? And maybe they will, maybe they won't. What is happening here? You wish I could stream more. Yeah, well, maybe in the next life. You all miss that. You all may not know this, but I used to stream a lot. <laughs> I used to stream a pretty good amount. I was um, one of the first Twitch partners that was a poker player. And um, like I said before, you know, they banned me before they even had poker. Then I asked them to come back. It was funny. They banned me and then they made uh, Jason Somerville a star. So go figure. <laughs> right place, but the wrong time. That's how life goes. But that's okay. I don't mind. Um, play a lot, you know. But now I'm instead working for all of you to help you maximize your win rates. Current rate structure is 7 to 9% for six max sit and goes. How does that compare to the rake when I was a sit and go champion? It's about the same. I'll tell you, that's, that rake you're telling me right now is kind of high though. You'll be signing up to poker coaching. Good. Go to pokercoaching.com slash pokercoaching.com slash spring sale and you'll get a discount. Shout out to your first best coach that changed your poker results. So oh, maybe, are, oh, you're talking about me. Well, good. Thank you. Congrats. I'm glad, glad things are going well. Only 44 likes. Come on, people, says Kevin. Yeah. Someone yesterday tried to get me to buy likes from them for $3,000. It was very bizarre. They issued a challenge to me to pay them $3,000 to have people like my content. Like, what in the world are you talking about? Um... We're not in this for the likes. If you, we're in this to try to help all of you. And, you know, inevitably, if you help a bunch of people, they will enjoy your content and like your content and do things to promote your content. What does a study group normally do? It depends on your study group, right? I would tell you to find very like-minded people who want to study the same game as you or you know, the same concepts as you. But at the same time, I mean... James Romero mentioned this yesterday. What he does, I don't know if he specifically mentioned this. I know what he does because he's told me. Basically, he has a group of people who are all very good at their specific thing. Turns out, I have a group of people who I also talk poker with, and I am their guy for one specific area of poker. I'm very good at playing short-stacked ICM scenarios. I might be one of the best players at that because of all the immense single experience, right? So when people have short-stacked questions, especially pertaining to payout implications, I'm their guy. And if I have deep stack cash game questions, I have another player who I ask those questions to, the really hard ones, and I'll generally default to their opinion on that because they're, they're the guy, right? And you want to make sure that you are really good at something such that people come to you when they need help. 
And then, in turn, you find other people who are really good at things that you may not be good at, and you get really, really, really good at that. Like James Romero was talking about how he is one of the best at using data to tell him how to adjust to the general player pool. And that's a highly valuable skill, right? And he may not be the best at some other things, especially when it comes to studying and whatnot, but he's really, really good at a few specific things, and that makes you highly valuable, right? And you want to make yourself highly valuable. What a lot of people think a study group is, oh, we're just going to play poker and talk about hands. But no, you need to be analyzing these things using the logical tool, but, and you want to make sure that you are actively adding to the group. Because if you're not adding to the group, you're just taking. And you know, while taking a little bit's fine, if you are consistently adding value, you'll stick around and people will want you around. I mean, this is, this is what I've done my whole career, basically, is tried to add value to other people's lives to the point that they want to give back to me, right? I mean, that's, that's how I get to live my life that I live to some extent, because I work hard for all of you all day, every day. And some of you appreciate it. Um, let's see. Can you still make dollars in 18 person sit and goes? You can make dollars in any game. You just have to realize that some games are easier than others. Good example of easy games. Nine handed sit and goes are very easy. Six handed sit and goes, very easy. Um, satellites, very easy. 18 man sit and goes are basically nine man sit and goes, very easy, right? These easy games are easier to solve. They're just, they're just simpler games. And simpler games get solved, and then everyone plays pretty well. And once everyone plays pretty well, there is no edge anymore. So then everyone is just paying the rake. Even if the rake's like 1%, you're still lose in some of these games. Which is why you've seen sit and goes just completely fall off the cliff, because everyone got good. Where'd my mouse go? If you want any... You can have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. It's true. If you think about this, if every person in the world gave you a penny, one penny, how much money would that be? I don't know how much money would that be, but it'd be a lot. It'd be enough. I would sign up for that deal. I'll just give me one penny from every human in the world. I'll be good to go. And um, it's kind of, kind of what you can do, right? I mean, any, any business does this, right? You trade something for something else. You know, if you're in a business, you trade something for money and... For example, I trade good, concise poker information delivered right to you in a learnable, digestible format for money. I also give away a lot for free, but you'll find that if you give away enough for free, people are happy to pay because you've helped them enough, all right? I mean, poker is a neat space where if you help people get like even a little bit better, then they're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> so if they make a lot of money, they're happy to throw you some money here and there. What starting bankroll is necessary to play online poker and make a living? This is not a good question because it depends on your win rate. If you don't have a win rate at all, no amount of bankroll will save you. Start at the tiny stakes and grind it up slowly. Is it more important as a professional competitor to maximize consistency or maximize the potential max... Wait. Hit your highest highs or try to minimize your lows? I don't know. I don't think like this at all. I just show up and play my best. And my best is usually relatively steady. That said, I mean, there are times where, like, you will be more in the zone than other times. And there's a lot of, like, research out there on how to get in the zone. There's a lot of um, study on coders, specifically, where they would rather their coder work less time, but be really productive in that time that they are actually doing the coding, when they're in the flow state, right? So Google flow state, Google in the zone, stuff like that, and... There are certainly times where I'm playing poker where like I'm really zoned in. And maybe that is the A-plus game or the A game or call it what you want. Maybe I'm only playing the B game at other times. I'm not sure. Again, it's like, it doesn't really matter the way you classify it. But there certainly are periods where you are playing at sort of like a heightened level. That said, I'm not sure if that actually gives you all that much more of a win rate. Because if your B game is very, very strong anyway, then your A game's good. Don't, I mean, don't get me wrong. Your A game is very, very good and better. But is it a lot better? Probably not. I think a lot of the... Um, potential downside is just fixed by learning to play good fundamentally sound poker and then adjusting accordingly. Maybe you just adjust you know, slightly worse. A penny from everyone is uh, $77 million. Apparently we, nobody knows how many people are, there are. So there's 7 billion people. That makes it, what, 70 billion? Is that what we came up with? It's pretty good. That's only a penny. Well, you can get a dollar. I think about that. 
You make the final table tournament, but the game starts. You receive bad news, and you mentally push it aside. Do you quit the table or continue knowing you played badly? If you're at the final table of a tournament, you should keep playing the tournament unless you like need to leave. I mean, this is always the fear of a professional poker player. I mean, maybe it's a fear, maybe it's not a fear. It depends on how much you care about things like this. But like, imagine your parents get sick or die or something while you're in the middle of a tournament, or your significant other gets sick or dies, and you're at the final table of a poker tournament. Do you just pack it up and leave, or do you keep playing? And um, I'm sure for some people, the answer is obviously get up and leave. For other people, the answer may be uh, play it out and then leave as soon as afterwards as you can. But even then, like say you're on day two of a ten of, of a five day tournament, right? It's 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 a crappy spot and a crappy thing to even think about. What's a good score on poker coaching quizzes? A hundred. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You're like get as good as you realistically can. You're not going to get a perfect score because it's hard to play specifically like someone. Also, some of the coaches play differently. But I would tell you to instead try to figure out what you can learn from it. And if you are generally playing well. It's $6 an hour at 25, no limit, over 50,000 hands, a good return. Depends on how many hands you're playing per hour, right? You want to look at how much you're winning per 100 hands. I did not sleep well last night. I was, uh, I was awake for like three hours. I listened to um, Olivia Bousquet's podcast. I like his podcast. He had a, I guess a discussion with Jennifer Shahade on scarcity and chess. It was fun. Complete random tangent off the top of my head. Don't know why we went there, but there it is. So anyway, you need to figure out how to play well under pressure and not under pressure. Some people have the opposite problem where when they are not under pressure, when they don't really care, they play really bad. You see this happen when, let's say you normally play five to no limit, but the only game in the uh, casino is a 1-2 game. You may just sit there and play, but then play really, 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 really poorly. And that's not good at all either. Uh, fortunately, I don't have that problem. I um, I just like can't play poorly. I was listening to Daniel Negreanu's podcast yesterday, talking about the Vinny, Vitti, Vinny Vitti giveaway on the Phil Galfon Challenge, where um, basically he was up 900K. Like, how could you possibly lose back 900K to stop playing high variance, right? And someone mentioned, maybe he just like, doesn't even know how to play low variance PLO and instead like low variance but small losing PLO in exchange for break even PLO but infinite variance right maybe he just doesn't know how to turn it off and um I I'm not very good at turning it off when it comes to like taking it easy or goofing off or playing bad hands for fun and that's a difficult thing to try to discuss with people on the opposite end but I think you need to treat all your poker play as if you are playing for real. Whatever for real means to you. What's happening here? Give me a second. You should treat poker professionally in all scenarios. That's essentially what I'm trying to say here. If you treat poker professionally in all scenarios, you will inevitably have professional level results. That comes from studying ahead of time, getting in decent physical shape, getting in good mental shape, like mental, physical shape, men mental, physical shape, getting in good mental shape and knowing how to play well and then showing up and doing it right. And doing it all the time when you play, not goofing off when you play, not donking around basically. And if you do those things on a very regular basis, you will develop a strong professional mindset. Is the world series postponed? They have not said anything about it as far as I know. You have so many new coaches at poker coaching. It's truly amazing to be able to learn from this, says Louis Philippe. Well, we're doing it for you guys. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I'm glad you're making use of it. How long did you play small six before I moved up? I bought in for $50 on party poker back in the day. They're still there. Thank you, party poker. And I turned that $50 into $350,000 in about a three-year period of time. But I did move up relatively fast. I kept about a hundred... No, what did I keep? I kept... 300 big bets for Limit Hold'em. They didn't have no Limit Hold'em really back in the day. So I played um, 25 cent, 50 cent. When I got to $300, I moved to 50 cent dollar Limit Hold'em. Then when I got to $600, I moved to one two no Limit Hold'em. One two Limit Hold'em. Um, that was thought to be a proper bankroll. You probably actually needed more of a bankroll back then, so I probably ran a little bit hot in the beginning. But I moved up a, in relation to my bankroll back then. You're new to poker and appreciate what I do. Well, good. Glad to hear it. 
Where's the best place for you to purchase my books? Financially for me, dnbpoker.com. Actually, if you go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash books, those links will take you to good places for me. Let's see. I'll send you a link. If you want to buy my books where I get a little bit of a kickback, go here, click these links, and get them from there. You all may not know this. If you buy anything from Amazon, <clears throat> anything at all from Amazon, go to um, someone's page where they have things for sale that go to Amazon. A good example is, um, I'm going to put a link right here. Here's a link right here. If you all click this and then go to Amazon, just click that link. Just click that long, ugly link there. Go there and then buy anything from Amazon. They will give Jonathan Little something like 7% back of whatever you buy. It's like rake back for getting you to go to Amazon. And you didn't have to buy the book, right? That's the cool thing. Um, I remember one time I was like randomly looking at it. Someone went, they clicked the link, they bought my book, and then they bought some watch for like $6,000. <laughs> Amazon gave me 7% uh, of $6,000, whatever that is. I'm like, oh, that's, that's nice. So, um, and you can do this for any person who you support, who you like, who has like Amazon affiliate links on their website. So that's, um, it's like free, right? You might as, well, might as well get back to some of your people. You notice changes in the poker coaching site. Yes, we we're trying to make it way more user-friendly. Some people are having a difficult time finding specific um, pieces of content. So we tried to figure out a way to make it easier. So now everything is searchable. You can search by coach, by date, by topic in the very near future, et cetera, et cetera. What's a good link for bankroll management? Okay. Can't type today. I have this keyboard way over here to the side. It's probably not the ideal spot for the keyboard, right? The keyboard should probably be in front of me. Um, I have to go now. I have a coaching session starting in five minutes. Is online poker playable without shark scope? Yeah, sure. You don't need shark scope. I think it's a good, useful tool, but you don't need it. It's not mandatory. And to be fair, you probably don't need anything, especially if you play on the sites without tracking, like um, Party Poker, right? Party Poker is a site where you can't use tracking tools, so you don't really need any of that stuff. That said, Shark Scope is useful because it can still look up the people. It can tell you if they're good, bad, et cetera, et cetera. All right, I have to go now. The solvers have a steep learning curve. Yeah, I would tell you to hire a coach. I was talking to James Romero yesterday. Um, he was saying that like he, he hires a coach for everything, just like I hired a coach for everything. Um, I wanted to get good at solvers, so I had Michael Acevedo help me, right? I mean, he's like the solver guy. Makes logical sense, right? Hire the people who are very good at what they do, and they'll help you. You're not buying a six thousand dollar watch, but you use the link. LOL. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Turns out, you know, if um everyone here gives me a dollar, that that's that's nice. It's not so hard to give me a dollar if you just go and buy whatever you buy on Amazon, right? Buy a ten dollar book. There you go. You just gave me seventy cents. We're good to go. Um, any advice for a struggling newcomer? Go to PokerCoaching.com. Go through all of the homework challenges. Start at the earliest and work your way forward. If you do all that, you're going to be way ahead of everybody else. So do that. That'll help you get good at poker. And now we have the spring sale. So check out pokercoaching.com slash spring sale. Let me see if I can actually pull up a slide. Can I do that? No, I can't do that right now. Maybe I can do that. Wait a second. Wait a second. Ugh, no, I can't do that. Brutal. So what happens when you try to do everything on the fly last second. I would tell you to try to not do everything on the fly. That is a big, 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 big mistake. Um, let's see, add source, screen capture, smart selection. Show you everything we have in pokercoaching.com. Here you go. This is in the premium section. You can go check that out at pokercoaching.com slash spring sale. And if you don't like it, if you do not enjoy pokercoaching.com, I do not deserve or want your money. So if you don't like it, between now and 30 days after you sign up, ask for a full refund and I'll give you a full refund. So as you can see, we have loads and loads of content at Poker Coaching. We have over 800 interactive hand quizzes. 
We have 130 video classes, 45 challenge webinars. We have a bunch of classes featuring many of the absolute best poker players in the world. We're continuing to add more and more and more content on a very regular basis. So check it out, pokercoaching.com slash spring sale. Right now, I know y'all have a little bit more free time due to this rough situation the world is in, and you might as well make use of it. If you have any questions about the sale, email us at support at pokercoaching.com. I see every single email that comes in. And I am happy to help all of you become the best poker players you can be. So check that out, pokercoaching.com slash spring sale. I have to go now. Hope you all have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Make the most of it. And I will see you all again on, is today Friday? What's today? Today is Friday. Wow, time flies. All right, I'll see all of you on Monday.